Good morning. Good morning. Hi, hi, hi. So nice to see so many of you here. Thank you so much for joining and amazing to see some familiar names as well. Thank you, thank you, thank you. I hope you have had a good morning. I know that uh, at the moment they can be a little bit up and down. Uh, I woke up this morning and decided today was going to be a good day. So I hope it is for all of you as well. Um, yeah, I just want to say again, thank you for being here. It means the absolute, absolute world. Um, before we kick off and introduce you to our incredible lineup of speakers, I want to cover some housekeeping, if that is okay. So everybody that registered, a lot of you submitted some excellent questions. Thank you. We've used them to populate a lot of the content today, so that was extremely helpful. But if you haven't, or if you, as you're watching this, have more questions, please, if you look down at the bottom of your screen, there's a little Q&A button. Click on that, submit any questions as you're going along, and we will review that and do our best to answer as many of them at the end of the session as we possibly, possibly can. Next thing worth mentioning is home internet. Um, we are all relying on the beauty of our home broadband speeds. So we will speak as slowly and clearly as we possibly can. But if there are any glitches, don't worry. We are recording this session and we'll send it out to everybody um, post event. Uh, I, don't, I don't actually know if I introduce myself. I'm Jilly Bain and I'm the director of Your GB events. And we are the producers of today's online event, Somewhere Over the Rainbow. Um, let me cover off why we're doing this, what it's all about, and who we are getting to hear from today. So to kick off, let's talk about the why. Why are we doing this? We are doing this because I am a business owner and times are scary, I think is the right word. And during my own process of trying to uh, firefight and find my way through uh, COVID-19, I did a lot of reaching out. I did a lot of connecting with people in the business community. And I was lucky enough to gather some pretty amazing insights, get some incredible advice, and just get a sense of um, not being alone through all of this. And, I felt that I wanted to create some sort of platform to sort of pay it forward because I feel that other people could probably have benefited from what I had been uh, learning along my own journey. So that's what today's all about. It's about sharing insight, sharing knowledge and trying to um, uh, take, uh, take inspiration from others, really. Um, what is today going to be, it's not going to be, to be me talking at you constantly. Um, we are going to have uh, three incredible speakers. Um, it will be three short 15 minute talks and a Q&A session at the end. And these talks are all built around trying to inspire us uh, and tell us what we can be doing to help ourselves now, help our businesses now, in order to sort of thrive and shine in the new normal. So without further ado, uh, I would very much like to introduce our incredible panel. If we can bring all of them in just now, that would be fantastic. I'll kick off by introducing Russell, who hopefully will be popping into your screen any moment now. Russell is our host for today. He is um, a director, a strategist. He is probably, to me, one of the most uh, connected people that I've ever met. And he is also an extremely experienced speaker and host. So he's going to be tying everything together keeping uh, keeping time and introducing each of our speakers as and when they arrive. We've also got Poonam, Poonam Gupta OBE, who is the chief executive of um, uh, international multi-million pound company PG Paper. We also have the amazing Professor Donna O'Boyle. Oh, hi, Russell, you're there. Hi, hi. Uh, the amazing Professor uh, Donna O'Boyle, who's the Professional Regulatory Advisor to the Scottish Government, also a registered nurse and 
if that wasn't quite enough, she is also a qualified lawyer. Um, and last but by no means least, we have Michael Anderson, who is a three times Californian uh, tech company entrepreneur, author, and to me, a uh, leadership specialist. Anyway, Russell, I will, <laughs> I will hand over to you because I feel like I've done an awful lot of the talking. Thank you very much, Jilly, and welcome everyone. I hope you can all hear me okay. Excellent. Thank you, Michael. So it's, it's very exciting to be doing this event today because what we're going to talk about is, I suppose, slightly contrary to the market in general, where we're going to try and find the positivity. We, as um, Julie's mentioned, we've got some fantastic speakers. However, I'd like to share a secret with everyone. So one of our speakers, one of our, our three incredible speakers I've worked with before and stood on stage next to him. And I've been trying to find a way to share a stage with Michael again, where I didn't feel like the small fat guy. Because my reputation is based on my height. I'm six foot five, I'm Scottish, but Michael's six foot nine or something insane. So the fact that this event is so good for me because we're all sitting down, so we're all the same height. So that's my piece of positivity for the morning. But um, we'll now get onto the serious part of the, the event. So I'd like to pass on to um, Poonam, who is, I met Poonam recently at a dinner and she was just sparkling with her insights into the global market. And I'm greatly looking forward to hearing from her this morning. So I'll just pass over to Poonam. Thank you, Russell. And for once, I don't have any complex from you regarding the height. I am so glad I'm not standing next to you. Welcome everyone to this fantastic webinar today and thank you for inviting me to be part of this team. We are all working from home, a lot of us actually, and it's actually nice to be able to have this platform where we can reach out to each other and learn to each other. I'm sure while I share some of these insights with yourselves, I will also learn a lot from the other incredible speakers who are speaking today. So I am Poonam Gupta and I'm the CEO of PG Paper Company Limited. PG Paper Company Limited is a company that I started in Scotland in 2003 uh, and today the company has been trading just, just short of 17 years. It's a global paper trading company uh, with offices in five countries and we are selling buying and selling in around 60 countries at the moment. Of course, it would be fair to say that, you know, over 17 years of my journey, both professional and personal, I have faced a lot of challenges. And I thought, you know, with every challenge uh, that I faced or a difficult situation, can I say, at least let's talk professionally. Some of them were gentle nudges and some of them were actually really painful experiences, which taught me something. I think every situation has gone on and taught me something. And, um, I would say that, you know, over the years, what I had built off, you know, a business that I built, which could possibly face anything. But hey, then comes COVID-19. I do have, we have an office in China. So when the whole thing started back in November, December, we were keeping an eye on the situation. We knew exactly the ground reports, which were coming from China, how the country was putting certain provinces in lockdown, what was happening. We were obviously concerned about our people in China. And then, you know, I, it, it kind of became, when it traveled through to Japan and South Korea, it became pretty evident that it was only going to be a matter of time till we get, you know, hit with the COVID 2019. And we knew about the lockdowns and it was quite evident that New Zealand, Australia, they were going in lockdowns. So again, it was only ever going to be a matter of time that, you know, we would go into the same situation. Talking about business resilience there, so, you know, a business, I always believe that an international business, it, it ha has an inbuilt ability to be resilient. If one market is not doing well, you go to the other market. If the other market is not doing well, you go to the third one. And we have 60 of them. So come on, 
Of course, we've built a very resilient business. But with COVID 2019, most of the countries, one after the other, went into a lockdown. Almost, I can say, some of them simultaneously and one, some of them one after the other. So we were losing revenue, left, right, and center. The customers were scared. They were not willing to talk to us. The supplier was were pushing us, saying, hey, where are our orders? Even though you know, they knew the situation, I felt that they were a little bit in the denial. And you know, the mills and the manufacturers who make paper for us, they need to run. It's an extremely capital-intensive process making paper. And they had to run their machines, or they would stand to lose millions and millions of dollars. So in the beginning, I would say, you know, when we went into lockdown a few days before that, a couple of weeks before that, we had already started to plan that we were going to go in a lockdown. So we started doing stress tests in our company where we started asking some of our employees to work from home. Uh, we also have an office in India, Sweden, Turkey. I did mention five of them, New York. We have an office in and we basically started stress testing and saying to our people, okay, today you guys are going to work from home to see that we will survive this lockdown. That came through okay. Now, thank thankfully for us, you know, because we expanded our offices in different countries, we also had heavily invested in our systems, allowing people to work in different countries and exchanging that live information they needed to ensure that the business runs smoothly. Now, I also know that's not the case for a lot of businesses. A lot of businesses maybe, you know, hadn't planned or hadn't gone through a situation, you know, or in their own journey, the way we had to have planned for some of the adversities. People were telling me that the revenues are likely to fall by 40%. Most of the reports that I was reading, you know, in the beginning when this whole situation happened, was telling me that, you know, the revenues are going to fall by 40%. But I had my own golden number. I always have my own golden number. I knew based on the feedback coming from multiple markets that this revenue fall is going to be way more than 40%. Thankfully, you know, there was an option given by the government for furlough. We had to take some tough decisions and furlough about seven people, explaining to them that their job was secured right now. The import, that then the importance was to make sure that the business remained safe and viable. And so that, you know, we could let people go for the time being to come back when we are, we are ready to go full steam again. I've said from the beginning, so I guess all of these, a lot of people don't know is beside PG Paper, I also have two other businesses. One is hospitality. I own Tribeca restaurants in Glasgow. And the other one is On Visage Dental Services, which I have seven branches in Scotland. And these businesses operate with people being in close proximity. PG is different. But these businesses aren't different. These businesses are your normal businesses where people interact with people, dentists work on patients. And we had to basically shut down these businesses. Was that hard? Definitely. There is no doubt that that was one of the hardest decisions we had to make. But the whole point is that sometimes we have to go through the tough decisions and tough journey, like I say, that, you know, difficult times and require innovative measures or sometimes hard decisions. What became important was to ensure that we bring our employees with us and if explain to them exactly what was happening and everything that we were doing was to protect them and the businesses. And to be fair, I had a really positive feedback. I have been saying, and I think I put a tweet out yesterday, which is something I believe very strongly in. We cannot just sit around and wait for the new normal to come to us. We have to create that new normal. We know the basics. We know that you know there isn't a vaccine except right now social distancing. We know that you know the government says if absolutely needed, you know, of course it changed yesterday. There was some confusion yesterday. But you know, the common sense is we know we have to social distance. We know that we have to be careful using public places. We know we shouldn't work in close proximities. Based on that. We have to be ready to create the new, uh, new normal rather than waiting for that new normal. That's the way it's going to be till a vaccine comes out. That's just how it's going to be. So what are we going to do? Are we going to adapt like a cactus does? Or are we going to become dinosaurs and we'll just wait to get extinct till somebody comes and rescues us again? For which I do not think 
the government's already done enough and more. They are still trying to do enough and more, but it's time to get up and say, okay, what are we going to do about our businesses? I saw a tweet this morning, which came from a hotel in Madrid, you know, which are opening back up and certain things that they are doing to make sure that their customers come back so they can go back into business again. I think that's also a way, a way to learn from each other what other businesses are doing. But I talked about my revenue streams earlier on. One thing I learned when the business, you know, I was seeing the turnover falling from the beginning, of, middle of March, it just kind of went like that. And, you know, something that I've learned, which really helped me was so important to stay calm. So important, you know, to stay calm and so important to have that patience. If I'm calm and patient and if I can, you know, spread that to my team, my upper level management, my middle level management, my, my people who work for me it becomes very easy to deal with any situation. There was no point of panicking. The panic, you know, doesn't troubleshoot. It doesn't help me find solutions which I need. So, you know, we had to basically make sure that we kept everybody calm. Like I said before, employees knew exactly what we are happening. Ask them to utilize their time more resourcefully for doing more research. For example, find, go, go find new markets, go find new customers, go find new products, you know, to ensure that our business bottom line doesn't get so hurt, you know, or it doesn't get so hit when we come out at the other end. So we started exploring the food business. We have been, you know, exploring business where, you know, can we buy devices, you know, which can, which can help fighting COVID in the near future when the businesses go back up. So, you know, like innovate to make sure that, you know, we can stabilize the business. And once this is over, go back on that growth track. And of course, re-strategize has to be done. We can moan about all these plans we made for this year. And oh my goodness, everything's fallen apart. Well, that's how it is. So let's deal with it and let's move on from it. That's the only thing that's going to help us. Other thing was, which I felt, you know, like as businesses, we have to adapt to this changing environment. Like I said, for us, let's give you a simple example. You know, we export paper. So we have a huge bundle of documentation. Once we send the containers out of whichever country they are going from to whichever country they are going to, we send that bundle out. You know, that bundle has to arrive at the customer's bank. So we get paid. We had to change our entire system overnight because the couriers weren't operating anymore. They were not taking our documents to the destined countries. We had to speak to, the, to our supply chain and ensure that we came up with methods with them so our customers still could still pay us, get the delivery, even though the documents could physically not reach their bank. Worked out really well. In a similar fashion, I would say that the restaurants have, are trying to keep up by doing more home deliveries, for example. Another thing, basically, what I'm trying to say is re-innovate or you know, your processes, if needed, readjust to them if you, know, you need to make sure that you know, your business stays on the growth path. Another problem faced with a lot of people working from home, productivity. I know from my team, you know, I know them, like we have a small team in green of 25 people, another 25 people in India. Not everybody is cut out, you know, to work from home. There are productivity issues. Plus with so many, so many system changes happening, some of the people furloughed, there is no doubt that some of the team has more pressure and is working harder than the others. What became evident was, that we needed to explain to them and support them in the short run, but also ensure that we don't burn them out in the long run. That, you know, we are already hiring. We are hiring because we are now planning our exit strategy. We are going to come out of this. We have realized that this has been such a huge learning curve, you know, these last few weeks and months. We've realized that, you know, what still we need to do better. We were thinking, oh, we've done it all. We can do this. But we can. Nobody, I think it's a learning curve. We learn something new every day. No, none of us are perfect. It's given us a chance to make ourselves better. And we are absolutely using this time to make ourselves better, to make our team more productive. We are providing them support, Zoom calls like this one that we are having today to ensure that even though we can see each other, you know, face to face, we keep up with what's happening in each other's life, you know, we support them with everything that they need. We make sure that they stay productive. If they are struggling, we provide them, you know, whatever, you know, sometimes it's just about talking and talking it out, you know, talking a problem out and maybe give them solutions for it 
basically clear leadership was what is what's required and we are doing our best both at the top level and managerial level to ensure that the teams feel com comfortable they stay productive and they know how we are going to come out of this finally we have we believe that we are over the worst at least some countries are starting to open again business is moving again it is accepted that the business will not come back to its usual normal in paper side at least for at least 3 to 4 months maybe longer planning for that so what becomes important is the exit strategy exit strategy like even basic stuff like when our team comes back to work how are they going to use the office how how are they going to sit down how are we going to ensure that you know when they use public areas that they are not passing any sort of infection to each other it is our responsibility to keep them safe we need them working we need them to be doing their job and the only way i can achieve that is to ensure that we have a solid exit strategy one some of the points i can share with you is we are not rushing for our teams to come back we are actually going to do it in staged way where some of them will come back there will be alternate weeks some teams are going to work alternate weeks social distancing there will be no compromise on that and basically to ensure their safety and to ensure that the business continues to run my business is even though with all the technology in place remains people to people business it is still a business which employs about 50 60 people around the world i need them working they are highly skilled and they have their jobs that they need to do i have people who support them but at the at the moment i also realize my absolute responsibility to support the business so as much as you know we have this problem which has been hanging over us we are going to come out of it we have i hope that you know all of you have used some of this time we've had at hand to ensure that you know we have relearned you know relearned also relearned a few skills not just you know how we go about our day we have stayed fit we can we have that immunity hopefully developing you know within ourselves by staying fit which can go on to help us fight the virus whenever it comes or you know just stay away from it is possibly an idea there are no travels which are going to happen for pg team for this year that's been decided stay positive government has said now stay alert i hope i've shared my story with you of the struggles that we've seen in last few months and how we plan to come out of it i hope this is, uh, session has been useful thank you for inviting me again and i look forward to hearing from other speakers thank you Poonam, thank you. That was absolutely inspiring. You hit every mark that I could imagine someone is asking about on how to plan their business. You talked about how we must create the new normal. We must adapt. You talked about staying calm, which I think is so important. But most of all, you got across the message about our people. I loved your line about we can optimize productivity through supporting our teams and enabling them. That was wonderful, Poonam. And I, I hope everyone got something out of that. Absolutely incredible. So we're now going to pass on to our next speaker. So without any further ado, I'll just pass on to Professor Don Boyle. Ah, you're there. Excellent. Good morning, Hi, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Hello. Thank you. Thank you. What a wonderful speech. And how am I going to follow Poonam? But I'm going to try. I'm very welcome, uh, happy to welcome you here today on the International Day of the Nurse. Very important. We don't often get celebrated. So um, I hope you remember that today as you, you ponder on what we can do to help one another as we go through this terrible crisis. Um, what I'd hope to do today is share with you some of my insights into culture and how it can support or not your organization and your business. It's vital within the NHS. We are an organization that strives to deliver one goal and one goal only, and that is to deliver excellent patient care. But that is a huge overarching goal, and we can't achieve it in one day. We can't achieve it with one strategy. We have to break that down into many, many common goals. 
I've worked in NHS and healthcare for well over 30 years now and I've made a study of things that can go wrong in terms of accidents both in and adverse events in healthcare and in many other industries and I hope to share some of those insights with you today to try and give you some thoughts for, for going forward and how you might arise from out of this crisis. But I'd really like to fo focus on culture and leadership because I think as everyone acknowledges, the cliches, culture can eat strategy for breakfast. But my own personal man mantra is culture can make your organization thrive or dive. And if you don't pay attention to that, to the softer issues, just as Poonam was saying about how you look after your staff and support them, they are the people that will get you through this. They are the people that will help you to innovate and move forward. My own journey stems from being a nurse, as I said, for many years. But I decided to study law because I noticed that we were spending a lot of money on people. Um, in particular, I worked in burns intensive care for 15 years. Very expensive to keep someone in the burns unit for even one day, never mind nine months, which many of our patients did. Huge group of those people were occupationally injured people, very badly burned, maybe thrown off of a scaffold 100 feet up, broke their back, their legs, etc. And we would spend a lot of money trying to fix these people and send them back into society. And on one occasion, a man who had been denied any possibility of recompense by his employers through the legal channels went home and after nine months with us, he committed suicide. And I thought, well, we've failed, haven't we? Hugely. Financially, socially, psychologically, medically, physically, in every single way. We need to be thinking about how we support people we care for and how we learn from that. And I decided to study law to understand reparation law and how we could help people while they were going through these crises in their lives. I wasn't given the support I wanted or I sought from my employer. And that's the first thing I'm going to say to you is about coming out of this crisis. How can you think about your teams and about yourselves? Are you using this time productively to reconsider what it is that makes your organisation tick? How can you actually gather new skills and think about what it is that you need to do to support one another? Move your business forward. Think about complementary aspects. Then my boss at that time said to me, you're not getting to study a law degree. I won't support you. But if you trot off and do an MBA, I'll part fund you. Now, with all due respect to people in the NHS who have MBAs, and there are many of them, that's not what we need is more of the same. We need these other skills to complement the people with the MBAs. And that's what I'd ask you to think about as an individual and as a business owner, perhaps. What's the change you need to see? What do you need to harness? The world has changed. I'm hoping it will change when we come out of COVID. We need to think smarter, quicker, be more innovative. I've seen changes in the last few weeks that would have taken us months, if not years, to achieve happen overnight. Look at how our F1 teams, Mercedes and McLaren, have adapted to make ventilators, medical ventilators for healthcare. They didn't stint, they didn't stop. They just said, let's do, let's change, let's innovate. Reputationally, fabulous. Their business may diversify. People will see them, the opportunities, and perhaps think about the opportunities within your own business to take that forward and diversify. You really have to be the person you want to be, be the change you want to see. And if you can think about, let's do something different, let's take our business in a different direction, or let's do it quicker or smarter, that would be really helpful. But if you don't listen to your staff, if you don't have a positive culture, if you don't have that support for them, you're not going to get there. In healthcare, it's a hard business. There is no room for passengers. I don't want to go to an emergency and have someone with me that doesn't know what they're doing. You need to think on your feet, you need to be creative. You don't have all the money in the world. You don't have all the funding you require. But what we do have is a never ending list of clients. Those people are having different um, comorbidities. Uh, there are new diseases emerging. People are living longer. They're suffering from different things. So we have to be creative. We can't do what we always did in the NHS or we would not survive. I looked to my team to help me. Uh, one example I would give you is um, years ago, we did go to a cardiac arrest and we didn't have a defibrillator for every ward. We had one between every two wards. And when the porter, whose job it was, on a receipt of that emergency bleep to go and get the defib, came with it to the ward, the defib wasn't working. It hadn't been charged. And when we looked at what had happened afterwards, we realised there was one plug in between those two wards where the defib sat, equidistant to each ward. And when we looked at exactly what happened in that corridor over a week, it happened, we understood that the cleaner would come along to buff the floors, she would unplug the defib, and not knowing what the defib was for, wouldn't think to plug it back in. 
If your team don't all understand what you're doing and why you're doing it, they're not going to be able to contribute to that common goal. Similarly, Bradford Football Fire in the 80s, some of you may remember it was a dreadful situation and it happened to be a live football match being broadcast on television. And the video is there for anyone to see. And as you can see, the minutes counting up in the corner of the television screen, you're thinking, why is there no ambulance personnel there? Why has no one come into that ground? It's in the middle of a big city, Bradford. There was only one old St John's ambulance in the ground itself. And people were trying to pull people who were burning out of that stand. Where were the emergency services? And when we look back at what happened there, the access into that football ground, as into many sporting grounds, is through a big tunnel. And the local health authority decided to buy new ambulances, but they bought huge big square ambulances that couldn't actually fit through that tunnel. So the care couldn't get there. You need to make sure that when you have your common goal, you can articulate your objectives and you can get people who understand every single member of your team, whether or not you think they're on the front line, whether or not they're a supplier, whether or not they're environmentally based, you need to make them understand what your objective is and understand your whole market. Similarly, we've seen situations in other organisations. There was a nurse many years ago called Beverly Allett and in the early 90s, she murdered a number of children and harmed many more. And one of the ways she did this was through the use of insulin. And you can only keep insulin in a drug fridge. It must be locked away at a certain temperature. And when you look back in police investigation as to where this insulin had come from, they audited the insulin supply to that ward and there was no increase. Well, what they did know is that she had managed the, the ward fridge door key had been lost. And we presume that she had taken it from the key ring. And what they didn't understand until much later was that whilst there's no increase in insulin to that ward, she was being asked to go and cover tea breaks and others, other breaks in other wards, and that every single drug fridge in the whole hospital had exactly the same lock, so one key would access them all. When we looked at the works department, they said, yes, we've, we were looking at the bottom line for the NHS. We, it was cheaper to buy a job lot of locks with the same key. They didn't understand the implications of one person being able to access any, any drug fridge in any ward. And again, it comes back to these were people who were sourcing parts, who were sourcing elements of, of kit, but they didn't understand the implications for the eventual outcome for that care. And therefore you need to involve all of your workers, make sure they feel part of the culture, they understand they're part of the solution, they're part of everything you want to deliver and make them feel welcome and secure. If you as a leader are not open to new ideas, you're not going to espouse the culture you want to see. New members of staff, students who come along in placement, when they ask you why you, they, you do things a certain way, stop to think, why are we doing it that way? Listen to new people, they're often the people that would give you that opportunity to reshape your business, to think about your procedures and processes and how can you move forward. I like to think that the NHS is always good, but it's not. It, we're human, we fail. We don't deliver on many occasions. That we, we think that up to one in 10 healthcare episodes can have an adverse effect on individuals. A drug missed, too much of a drug given, too late, too small amounts of drugs, the wrong kidney taken out operation. These are horror stories, but we have learned from them because we are human and humans make mistakes. And what we've had to do, looking at other industries again, for instance, years ago, um, you would go to the cash machine, the hole in the wall to get your cash out. And when they first came on board, you would put your card in, you would ask for the money, your cash would be delivered, and many people walked away leaving their card in the machine, which were then used as fraud. And what we've done now is design a system so that you don't get your cash out until you've actually removed your card from the machine. It's a small but subtle change. We have to force the human into doing the thing that we want them to do to be successful. Can you think about reviewing your processes? Can you think about what it is that you might need to do to make sure that your processes are more streamlined, you achieve the outcome you want and the time frame you want as well. I do think COVID has brought a lot of challenges, but I think it's also brought a lot of advantages. We have seen, even this week, the uh, increase in requests for electronic consultations with GPs, with consultants in the hospital. That's a good thing for us. We wouldn't have thought of it in quite the same time frame. We wouldn't have achieved it. It's such a challenging thing to do is make sure people are on your side all the time. If you're a manager, if you're a leader, it doesn't matter what your role is actually in the organisation, how senior you are, everyone's a leader. You want to make sure that you empower your staff to be the people they can be when you're not there, when you can't give that direction, when they achieve 
when they attend in the emergency for themselves, you want to know the outcome is the same as what you would have had. And I think that's your success. And for industry, I think that's where you're going to have to go in terms of all of the insights that Poonam and others can give, is that you need to re-engineer, um, look again at your market, look again at your resources, in particular, your people. You think you're a listener, you think you're open. I've heard people say, my door's always open, I'm a great manager, people can come to me and speak. But in actual fact, that's far too passive. People will not come to your door and say, I have an insecurity, I'm not sure what I can do here, am I allowed to? You need to go out and be active and seek and listen to people. I hope that I've been able to give you some insights from those perspectives. When you look at other industries such as um, in, uh, transport, uh, if you have a train crash, most often the poor train driver drives along with, dies along with his train, as do airline pilots. And what do we do? Quite often we, we criticise people, we prosecute them. It's not the way to learn. And if I look at matters of communication, how clear are you in communicating your strategy and in your internal requirements? In the M1 Kegworth air disaster, again, the late 80s, um, I think it was about a year or so after uh, Lockerbie happened, um, the pilot made a fatal error. One of the um, engines went on fire and he closed down the wrong engine. And not everyone died and there was a resultant uh, public inquiry and one of the air stewardesses was giving evidence to this inquiry. And the judge said to her, you could quite clearly see, as could the passengers, the left-hand engine was on fire. Yet when the pilot said over the tannoy, ladies and gentlemen, I've shut down the right engine, why did you not immediately run up to the, to the cockpit and tell him he'd closed down the wrong engine, that the plane was going to crash? And she says, well, a couple of reasons, really. She says, first of all, I'm just a stewardess. We don't question the captain. He's much more educated than we are. He's in charge of the whole flight. She didn't think that she was the leader in the cockpit that day. In the, in, in the, she was the one that had the information. She was the one that could take the action. She didn't want to act on it for fear of what might happen if she did. And secondly, she said the other reason is that pilots don't speak in terms of port and of left and right. They speak in terms of port and starboard. She says, so had he said, ladies and gentlemen, please don't worry, I've closed down the starboard engine. She says, I would immediately have realised he'd closed down the wrong engine. And I could have told him that had I not been so frightened to do so. But because he said the right engine, I thought he meant he'd closed down the correct engine. And so yet again, when you're articulating your strategy and your objectives, you have to be absolutely clear that the language you use is understood by everyone, by your customers, by your staff, by everyone that needs to hear that message. I'm not suggesting it would have fatal consequences for your business, but it's something we can learn from. I really hope that I've been able to inspire you with some insights from health um, and from other, other places today, not to frighten you, but to say we have the opportunity to learn and to move forward. And I'd like to finish really by um, parodying, if you like, um, something that JFK said in his uh, inaugural presidential uh, speech, which was, don't ask what your organisation can do for you, but ask what you can do for your organisation. Thank you. Donna, I hope you can hear the applause. That was a wonderful talk. Thank you so much. You've reminded us today that it's International Day of the Nurse. And I don't think, as a country and perhaps as a world, we've ever had so much respect for the medical profession as we do at the present moment. We've just got, we've just got to remember that forever now. That's where our respect lies. Like Poonam as well, you emphasised that it's our teams that are important and we have to make sure that there's an understanding of the culture within the organization and everyone understands how they matter every single person can tell us what's wrong and what's got to get changed and everyone's got to feel empowered to do that i love your line about saying it's not enough just to say the door's open you've got to go out there and that's something perhaps i've i've been slow to learn in my career but i try hard every day to do that so Thank you so much for your words. You get the, we got a tingling. I have a tingling in the back of my neck on what you said. Thank you so much. You're welcome. Thank you, Donna. Um, and our final, <laughs> thank you, Donna. Um, our, our final speaker for this session, and with, fortunately, M Michael has experience as a professional speaker, so I'm sure he won't be daunted following on from two of the most remarkable talks I think I've ever heard. But I'll finally go over to you, Michael. 
Well, thank you, Russell. And, and I think this is such an important event. And when Russell called me and told me what he was going on, what was going on, I said, this is very needed right now. When I talked to Jilly and I heard what her and uh, your GB are doing, I said, look, this is important. And so I'm so, uh, to me, it's really heartening that we have this panel of speakers and we have all the attendees out there because this is the time for leadership. Look, I'm not going to lie to you or sugarcoat things. This is a difficult time. It's a difficult time for businesses. It's a difficult time for countries. It's a good, difficult time for families. It's a difficult time for you and me and every single person out there. And when it's difficult times, this is when we need leadership. And we need leadership from everybody. We need leadership. And this doesn't mean if you it doesn't mean you need to be a leader of a country or a company. This is for those individual NHS workers that are having to deal with it. Maybe they're a single mom or a single parent that have to drag themselves into work and their family has to rally around and help them with childcare. This is for people that maybe have owned a restaurant or work in a restaurant and all of a sudden are staying home. These are for people that are put on furlough and are doubting themselves and, and just stuck in this thing of negativity. Everybody needs to bring their best because I'll tell you what, when we go through crises, when we go through downturns, this is when leaders need to step up because if you are a leader and no matter what situation you are, you are a role model because your team, your company, your family, your friends are looking to you to see how you react and you respond through this. And so it's more important than ever that you bring your best and you bring your A game and you bring your positivity and, and lead people through this anxiety and lead people through this negativity to get them, to keep them, to give them optimism and give them hope. Because at the end of the day, that is going to be what determines success for you and everything you're involved in. Because it's when, when things get tough is when your character will be tested. You know, anybody can be a leader when the economy is good. Any can be, anybody can be a leader when things are going great. You know, just listen to, for example, Poonam talk about what she's doing and how, and the, 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 honestly, the burden and the responsibility she's taking on her broad shoulders and doing for her team and doing for everybody else. And she's talking about creating the new normal. She's talking about getting in front of the new normal and, and defining it in themselves. And we need leaders like that. So if you're in a leadership position, you are in a, you're a role model, whether you like it or not. And so it's important for you to, to know that. And I'm not here to, to, to argue whether that's fair or not. That, that's a fact. And, and, and your reputation is going to be most likely determined over these next couple of weeks and months because we need leadership more, more than ever. So let me tell you a little bit about my background, and, and I'm going to tell you about why I know about crises, because I've been through a lot of crises. I've handled some of them well and some of them not well. Um, in fact, I've been through 9-11, um, and I, I work for, for a U.S.-based company. I'm obviously American. I, li I live near London now. I had a lovely British woman. She, she dragged me over here. She, says, she said it doesn't rain that much in England. I'm from Southern California, from San Diego, but uh, I, I think she told me that. I, I, want to, I, want to, I want to fact check that, but um, she's worth it. It's worth it. I, I, I love life over here. Um, and I went through 9-11 when I worked for a U.S.-based company, and that shut everything down. It leaves with, with the current thing we're going through. We've had some lead up to that. When 9-11, the terrorists hit New York, boom, everything stopped, and, and we didn't know what hit us, almost literally. Uh, and then I went through a really bad... Um, uh, lawsuit a couple years later and that I thought I was going to lose everything very very difficult on my time sent me into a depression didn't know I, luckily I had a good support group carried me through that and then when when the great recession hit in 2008 2009 and this is a time I, I, I own three companies we actually doubled revenue and doubled profits through that time because I knew what to do as a person and a leader and I knew what my organizations had to do as well um, and I just wanted to share a little bit about, about that because I've been, over the last couple of weeks, I've been on the phone basically nonstop. It's, it's interesting. I've been as busy as I've been. And Russell, I talked to Russell, he's been the same way, um, leading and advising other leaders how to get through this, this place. So I've talked people through um, getting the different uh, uh, governmental assistance, both in Europe and the U.S., through this. I've talked to a lot of people on how to do layoffs, how to put furlough, how to decide whether they put people, uh, lay people off or put them on furlough, how to help them save their companies. And I'll tell you what, as leaders, as, 
you know, the burden and responsibility people are taking on, you know, and, and Don has talked a bit about that too. Um, this is, there's, I talked to one relatively young CEO. He had to lay off a third of his staff. The other third, him and, and, the, and the other third had to take 30% pay cuts. And he was, he was in a, in a low mood. And he said, you know what, this is, this is the toughest day. I ever, Yesterday was the toughest day I ever went through in my life. And I'm like, yeah, I get it. It should be difficult. These are difficult decisions. And I'm not, you know, again, we, part of leadership is being honest. And, and part of leadership is not acting like things are okay all the time. Because th this is time where you need all your mental facilities and all your emotional facilities and you need a good support network. And again, what jilly has been able to do is bring together community and community can really help pull people through this as leaders because, you know, we're going to go through these ups and downs. And when we can be honest about when we're down a bit, when we have an uplifting community that can pull us up, that often is the, the, determinant, the determiner between uh, between success and failure. And so I've been on the phone with a ton of different business owners and senior business leaders, helping them get through it. Because at the end of the day, um, your organization, if your organization doesn't survive, your team doesn't survive, nobody wins. And so a lot of people had to make very, very difficult decisions right away in order to uh, survive this. Um, and that might have meant Get, break, uh, you know, for example, letting some people go that have been with them for years and years and, and, and had a lot of loyalty. And that, that really tugs at the heart of, of, of the business owners out there and the business leaders out there. And maybe you're on the other end of that. And hopefully, you know, for example, the communication was well and you saw the difficult time that the leaders were going through. And, and, and I know a lot of people are going through more change now than they perhaps ever been in their life. And that's okay. It's okay to have these ups and downs. If, there, if there's one thing I want to communicate to you, look, I go through it as well. Me and my wife, she does coaching. Uh, and, and we've noticed that we're a little bit a little bit quicker to snap at each other and a little bit easier to, to sometimes focus on the negative. So it's really taken a collective consciousness to really get people onto a higher level. And I just wanted to tell you a little bit about my background. You know, I started as a programmer. I worked my way up the corporate ladder. I, uh, I lived overseas for a while and then I moved back to California. I started one company and then, then a second company and we had some success. But then I, I realized we, we, we had some issues. We had some issues with employees. Our culture wasn't very good. And back then, I didn't even know what a culture was. I mean, I was this hotshot programmer in my mid-30s. I, I was really smart and really driven. I was a bit immature, didn't have some, a lot of seasoning. And I just put, a lot, put some smart people together. And that was okay when we were five or 10 people. But as I, I, as I grew a team, as I needed to be a leader, we really struggled because I didn't know how to lead. I didn't know how to motivate. I didn't know how to, 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 to hold people accountable without being a jerk. I thought leadership was just getting a bunch of tasks and giving them out to anybody, everybody, and then basically getting angry or getting frustrated when they didn't get them done as quick or as well as I thought they should. And that obviously caused a lot of frustration. A lot of really key employees started to quit. We started to lose big customers. Um, and then I really took that personally because I was used to being this high achiever. And then all of a sudden, I, you know, I, I all of a sudden owned this company. We had the sales, but I'm just, I wasn't delivering. And then I started to get that negative self-talk where I got down on myself. I had some substance abuse issues with some hard drugs and some alcohol. Um, I got into this massive business lawsuit with an ex-employee. I thought I was going to lose everything. It made me really, really doubt myself. And even before all these things, I'm like, you know, I just wasn't enjoying it. Here I am, I finally reached my dream. I have a successful company and it wasn't fun. And I realized, and I had this great, great guy, Ron Harrell, who was one of my, my mentors. And I noticed that he's, he was a business owner. He just had this really calm way about him. And I got to know him. He started mentoring and coaching me. And he goes, Michael, what made you a great technical person and a great programmer has almost nothing to do with making you a great leader. I'm like, well, what do you mean, Ron? He's like, look, you're, you're driven and you're used to outworking these, these problems. And, you know, you're a bit ego based because, you know, you're doing this in a way to get uh, to, to get people to, to, to have your worth is your, your, your worth. Your confidence is based on people thinking that you're a good technical person. Now, all of a sudden, you have this team and you have this company and it's getting big. We need you to be a communicator. We need you to connect to people. We need you to be authentic and vulnerable. And I, I, I sort of understood those words, but I didn't know how to get there. 
And so what, what Ron did is he pointed me to the same program that he went through, and I ended up earning a master's degree in spiritual psychology. Now, yes, this is what we do in California. <laughs> when I say spiritual psychology, it's nothing to do with religion or anything. And we learn psychology, but what, what it is, is we learn psychology from a place of pure love and compassion. Yes, that's right. I talk about love in all my leadership presentations. And what happens is, um, as a leader, you know, when I went through the, this master's, this two-year program in, in this psychology, and we learned the same psychoanalysis techniques you would learn in any other psychology program, but I really used it, and, and we would apply it on ourselves and, and really dig into our deep, dark secrets and, and all the ways we were holding ourselves back. And, and, and what I mean by, I guess, spiritual psychology is we take the assumption that we're all loving beings at our core. And what it is, we have all these psychological unresolved issues that are holding us back from really connecting to our true selves. So over these couple of years that I, I went through this, it's like I, I let go of all these things that were, that were in, in, in the way of me really loving and accepting and being comfortable with myself. And so my journey, as I got to know myself and trust myself and quit judging myself and being negative about myself and really accept who I was, I started to flourish as a leader. Because really, that's what people are drawn to. People are drawn to, to leaders that are comfortable with themselves. Because everybody talks about how leaders have to be authentic and vulnerable. You're absolutely right, but you're authentic and vulnerable. It, it, it's a symptom. You can't tell anybody that's, for example, insecure to be more authentic and vulnerable. You can't force yourself to do that. That's a, that's a, a result of people being more comfortable with themselves. Once I start to, to know myself, once I start to accept myself, then I can truly be authentic and vulnerable. And then what happened is when I started to be that type of leader, my company started to thrive. I mean, we were listed on the Inc. 5000 list a couple years in a row. We were, uh, we were voted number one best place to work. I was social entrepreneur of the year. That was on the outside, but on the inside, I was starting to finally have fun. I didn't feel so isolated. I didn't feel like it was everybody against me. I didn't feel so competitive from that negative standpoint because I started to really connect with my customers. I started to really connect with my employees because I had that true empathy. We were in it together. We started giving back to our community. And it's like, that's, I think, why we all get into business. And I heard that from all the leaders on here, from Donna, from Poonam, from, from Jilly, from Russell. And, and it's like, I finally figured out the, the secret to, on how to do that. And, that. and my business has flourished. And now that's what I do. I teach the, the same system on how to be an empowering, positive leader to Uber, to Microsoft, to Salesforce, to uh, PwC, et cetera. And that's why I just wanted to share a little bit of these tools and techniques to you. So what I, what I wanted to tell you, I wanted to, and you know, you may know these things already, but I may be giving you reminders, but it's so important for us to be positive leaders because there's so much negativity out there because you know what, we're wired, I'm a psychology person, so we're wired for negativity because if you look at our wiring for the last 10 or 20,000 years, we had to worry, be worried about protecting ourselves. So our ego tried to protect ourselves. You know, because years and years and years, we've had to protect ourselves from man eating dinosaurs, from other tribes, et cetera. And, and you'll, you'll notice this because if you ever get angry, right, on, on something, even if you, and, and say um, somebody made you angry, but you, you found out like two minutes later that it wasn't their fault, you, you, you had a misunderstanding. Sometimes times it takes a while for that anger to go down. That's because you have that fight or flight response, your, 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 your cortisol is up, your stress hormones come up. We're meant to go into this fight or flight because we had to protect ourselves. Well, you know, in 2020, we don't need that kind of protection, but our, we're still wired for that. So what Jilly said today is she was, she, when she woke up, she chose to make this a good day. Now, although you can't control all your feelings, you can control what you do with them. So if there's one thing I'm going to suggest that you do, you really get you may, and again, you may know this, but I, I bet that there's deeper levels that you can go into this in your life of, of really understanding what you can control and what you can't control. Because there's only one thing in the world that you can control, and that's yourself. That means you can't control what other people post on Facebook and Instagram. You can't control that. You can't control what a prime minister or president says or does. And so you can get upset about that if you choose, but that's doing nobody any good. Now, I want to make a differentiation. There's a difference between um, not 
judging and not reacting to something and not agreeing. For example, if a politician says something that I don't agree with, I cannot agree with it without getting upset. So as you go through social media, as you watch BBC or CNN or whatever, my uh, challenge to you is to take that as information without getting upset and also looking about what positives you can find in there. And when you find yourself getting upset, that's almost always because you're trying to control something out of your control. And there is so much in your control. And, and every time you find yourself getting upset, I want you to turn that around and see what you can do that's positive. I want you to reach out to somebody. I want you to call people. I want you to call more people, call more friends, call more employees, call your current boss, your old boss, and have a, a human to human conversation with them. Because nothing will get you more present. Nothing will, nothing will get you in, in a better mood than connecting with somebody. And you know, there's, there's emails, there's texts, but nothing replaces a phone call. I, was a, I, I had a radio show, and the, the guy who was training me in that said, there's an intimacy about audio, especially when one person's talking uh, to you on the phone that, that, that really can bring you together. And because we need positive leaders, there's so much negativity. And, and again, this is really a rallying call to you as leaders. So I want you to take a couple minutes after this presentation, I want you to reflect on where you're at right now. And then I want you to figure, to, to redefine the type of leader you want to be for the next three months because we had a couple more weeks of this and we need you to come at your best and we need you to show up positively. And so I want you to write down what you're stressing about that you can't control and what you can control and what is your action plan. So this may be watch less media. This may be to anytime you make a social media post, make a positive social media post. This may be, you know, I talked to Russell. He is reaching out to a lot of old contacts just to get in contact with them. I'm doing the same thing. And my goal there is always to, to bring some positivity into my life and bring some positivity into their life because that's really what great leaders do. So Russell and, and Julie and everybody, I, I, I hopefully this was, was helpful to you, everybody out there in the audience. Just remember, you are so powerful. You have so much influence out there. And it's really a rallying call to every single leader in a time of crises, really to show up and bring their best. Fabulous, Michael. Thank you for that. Happy I think everyone that. probably knows how I remain so positive. <laughs> So you've just had an insight, everyone, in how, to I, how I am able to remain positive in times of adversity and crisis. I have people like Michael Anderson, who are part of my support team, and he's always there. I can pick up the phone and go, hey, I'm really struggling on this subject. What do you think? And he's, he's fantastic at putting everything back into context. So, so Michael, you shared some wonderful things when you spoke. And, and you also mentioned a word that I've heard, a word I've heard a lot in the last, um, the last few weeks, and the word is love. You know, I was, I was really struck when the Prime Minister mentioned his love for the NHS when he, uh, when he was released after being um, treated for COVID-19. I've also held it used a lot within our family, particularly because I, I feel we've probably been in, communicated more with our, our more distant family in the last few weeks than we've probably done for a long time. So I'd like to thank you for reminding us of that. Um, we talked about building a support team, taking responsibility, and you've also set us two challenges. Challenge number one is to reach out to someone and just have a call with no purpose at all. And secondly, to sit down and contemplate how you could, what kind of leader you want to be and how you can build a plan to accomplish that. So thank you so much, Michael, for that. Happy so everyone, that's our, that's our, well, I've got to get better at this. <laughs> So um, that's our three speakers. So we're now going to have a, a short um, Q&A panel. And what I've done is I've taken the various questions we got asked at the start and also asked them um, during the talks. And I've now merged them into questions that I can ask. So if I could ask the panelists to come back in again, please, and Jilly. Thank you very much now. Now, uh, Jilly, we, we released the um, questionnaire at the start. Do you want to release it again at the, at the end of the Q&A so that people can um, re-complete that and we'll see if we've had what kind of effect these conversations have had? No problem. Uh, we'll do it at the end. Thank you. Now. 
So um, I'm personally feeling better after listening to those three completely different, completely brave and incredibly honest presentations. I think there's something about this medium that's different from the, the big auditorium where we get this almost a feeling of confidentiality with what people are sharing. So I, I had a couple of questions that I wanted to put to um, the panel. So I'll just work out I'm going to do this. So um, my, my WhatsApp stream is full of people saying well done to the speakers. Here's the questions. <laughs> So the first question was, maybe I could, I, I could ask Poonam, because you used that wonderful word, calm. What, what's the approach that you take to bring that element of calm into your life as a, as, as a professional business leader? So I would start by saying I completely agree with Michael. Michael, you know what you said about control. And I kind of in my head was finishing the statement for you that the only thing we can actually control truly is ourselves. And that's the absolute basic of when I use calm and peace and patience. Back in 2000, I'll quickly go through this, you know, back in 2007 and eight, I had a situation in Pakistan. It was so grave at the time that I actually had a couple of weeks of sleepless nights. And to the point that, you know, I started taking sleeping pills because I just couldn't calm down. And when I hit that, you know, in two weeks time, I obviously went through my own journey, you know, of realization, what was going on, how was I going to deal with it? It was a little bit out of my control, what was happening in Pakistan and the pressure was huge. And I realized after two weeks, I guess, you know, I hit my natural bottom, you know, my own natural bottom where I like, I couldn't sink anymore. And I asked myself, what do you want to be? What was the goal? Have you forgotten where you want to be? And I made my, I, re, I had this self-realization that I want to build this multi hundred million pound business, you know, and if at that time the company was hardly doing 20 million pounds. And I asked myself, you are not capable of dealing with the stress a 20 million pound organization brings to you. How are you actually fooling yourself in believing that you are capable of running a hundred millions uh, worth of a billion, hundred million pound worth corporation. And that was that my eureka moment, if you say, or my moment of realization that this can go on. There should be something I'm able to do and I'll have to rein in, take the reins back and I'm going to resolve that issue and move on from it, underwrite the losses that I had and we'll move on. That was my moment and that moment has stayed with me till today. So when COVID-19 happened, I had a couple of days where I'm like panicking, but I tend to withdraw in myself when I have that moment of panic. And then I remind myself, where am I and where do I want to be? And that means to be where I want to be, I have to deal with my today. Now, some things like, so this is basically kind of me being corporate spiritual, if you like. But if you ask me, what do I do? I kind of try and divert my attention is, you know, to what matters to me, what makes me happy. Now that might be taking a walk in the garden, you know, to say, right, I need to stop everything. No more phone calls. I need to focus on myself to ensure that I get my balance back. Or, you know, I watch a nice movie once in a while. I'm not much of a TV watcher. Well, you know, read some news because that's something I love to do is to know absolutely what's happening in the world. Uh, or, you know, just like, just doing spending time with my children doing something which will take my distract me completely for me to come back to that middle level balance that I need and move on from it and honestly I cannot just stress the importance of keeping yourself under control like Michael said and believing in that patience and come yeah the the worst is happening but so what you know it can only get better once it, you know, like, like the good times, bad times don't last forever. So that's my take from it. Thank you. The good times won't last forever. That's a wonderful line. And thank you for sharing that insight into, into you personally, Poonam. Because we you know, we, we all, everyone gets these impressions about us who are in sort of um, visible positions in business. We must be this or that. We're just exactly the same as everyone else. So thank you for sharing that. 
That, that question about remaining calm, if I could ask that to Donna as well, because Donna, what you must have seen in the, in the health service and the NHS over the last few weeks, that must have been, I, I, I can't imagine what the scenes must have been like. How, how do you manage to remain calm in that type of environment? It's about personal resilience, isn't it? And when you think about the training uh -huh. you go through as a nurse, um, uh, you are trained to assess every situation and assess the principles and the priorities and what needs to be done there and then and what you can leave until later. And I guess that's similar to what Poonam was saying, is that there are things you have to do, but there are other things that don't, you have the luxury of time to deal with. But the personal resilience comes from within uh, teams, mutual support, listening to one another, we're all in it together. And it comes back to what I was saying earlier and also Michael mentioned about that leadership honesty. You cannot be all things to all people. Um, so you have vulnerabilities as well. But it is about recognising that you have to have some degree of self-care because if you can't look after yourself, you cannot look after others. And that others will include your business and it will include your employees. If you try to soldier on and have that brave face, then others will see you doing that too and think they have to be the same. And what you find is that people will crumble eventually, if not socially, if not physically, then definitely mentally. So we do need to have that personal resilience built in, but it comes from years of training and years of understanding where your limits are. You're not working by yourself. You have a team approach. You can use them without showing that you're failing, but you are vulnerable just like they are as well. Wonderful. Thank you so much for that. And, and I was thinking when, when you were both speaking there that um, what do I do? And I give myself permission to fail. And, and it sounds silly to give yourself permission to fail, but as a child, when I was at school, if you did something wrong, someone with a great big wooden ruler would wrap you on the knuckles with it. So you kind of got out the habit of allowing yourself to fail. So that's what I do. Um, and, and I want to come on to the, the second part, which was about, we've all spoken about this new normal we're going to have to create. And there's been several questions about the process to do that. And, 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 and I think, Jilly, you'll be going through this at the moment. So when you have to change your business to find the new opportunities, what is the process you go through to do that? You know, it's, it's not just an inspirational moment. It tends to be data gathering. But, but Jilly, what process have you gone through for, in, in the event sector? I think for us, it was, well, after an initial... Uh, fairly frantic period of um, firefighting, I'll call it, in terms of our events and uh, cancelling and rescheduling and all of that. It was trying to figure out uh, what, what were the problems our clients were facing and what needed to be answered. So finding their pinch points and trying to figure out how best we could support them with working working through them. So for us, it's, um, it was translating what were, uh, you know, engaging, amazing live events uh, where people gather together, that's the crux of it, um, and trying to deliver them in a way that would uh, be possible in this climate. So taking them online, Russell, we, we've been working very hard with clients to get their events online and where not possible postponing them and reacting to the situation as best we can. But I think it's, t it's speaking to your clients, speaking to your suppliers, speaking to everybody, as many people as possible to try and figure out where we could best help. That, that was what we did and continue Thank to do. Thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you very much for that. So I'll just put that, I'll put that question, we've only got a few minutes left. So I'll put that question to Michael and then I've got one final brief question to each four of you. So, 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 Michael, how do you, how do you go about that 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 process? When yeah, the there is. You know, yeah, what I what I've run into is that, that people often hold themselves back with thinking the way they've always been thinking. Uh, you know, I have one of my clients. She runs a trauma center in the U.S. where people with trauma come in and they give psychological counseling. And when this started to happen, I, we were on a call and I said, well, how about doing it over the phone? And she goes, well, I don't know how to take, uh, do intakes, you know, the first initial call over the phone. I'm like, well, figure it out, you know, basically figure it out. I mean, it was a longer conversation than that, but she had a mental block 
that was 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 preventing her from even thinking through that whole process, which is now a major source of income for her. And I'll, I'll tell you what, I've, a little PSA, public service now, so for announcement for Russell, I've been on, on board and advisement ready to meet with Russell, and there's no better person that gets companies thinking out of the box for income opportunities than my, fr my friend Russell. And uh, so if anybody out there is, is looking for some creativity, um, bring him in for a, a, one of the strategy calls because he will get your butt moving. He will, he will make you uncomfortable in the best way possible. But that's what it takes. You know, you, you, the, the people that are going to win, and I'm working with a professor, Dr. Nick Quinn from Glasgow University, and we're, we're, what we're going to do is we're going to have a presentation on who the winners of past crises are, and it's people that have resources, it's people that are think outside the box, it's people that develop re, uh, relationships, and um, and that, that you know they get they get out of their own way and just like Russell said, they aren't afraid to fail and they throw themselves out there. Yeah. Thank you, Michael. Uh Personally, thank you very much, Michael. <laughs> um, so I, I'd just like to uh, to run through the panel with with one final question, which is just you know I, it's quite difficult to do, but if you could sum up in one sentence or a, a couple of sentences, you know how how you feel at the moment, having listened to the other speakers. So I'll start with them. Um, I'll do Jilly, then Donna, then Michael, then Poonam. So, so Jilly, how, how do you feel now, an hour and a half later, have, having listened to these talks? I feel uh, motivated, I think is the word I would use. I feel like um, we're, we're all in this together. Everyone's going through it, but there are uh, behaviors and things that we can do to crack on and try and move forward and innovate. Excellent. Thank you, Jilly. And Donna? I feel enthusiastic. I think that we can embrace these opportunities. I don't doubt the impact it's had on people's lives and on their businesses, but out of the ashes, rising like a phoenix, there are opportunities using these clear strategies of support, resilience, um, innovation. I, I think a lot of people will see the businesses change possibly for the better, although it wouldn't have been the way they would have wanted it to have happened. Thank you. Thank you, Donna. Thank you for that. And Michael? Well, I really appreciate this because I, I think for the last couple of weeks, it's been me holding up other leaders um, just by the nature of the relationship I have with them. And, and to hear some successful leaders coming with that same positive message, it's been great me being an attendee on here. And, um, and you know, it, it is time for all of us to really take stock and do this. And it's just, again, like, like any other com positive uplifting community, I, I just want to thank uh, Jilly and your GB and Russell and, all, and and the other two speakers for really adding a little extra smile to my step today. Thank you so much, Michael. So I'll just leave it with yourself, Gupta. For the, uh, sorry, Gupta. Sorry, Poonam. It's okay. You can call me Gupta. I don't mind. Oh, yeah. <laughs> well, I I feel like um, it's always great to share a platform with um, other great leaders, and I think it for me it's a moment of positive reinforcement you know we we are doing what we are doing but it's also to know that you know that we are doing it we are heading in the right direction and you know we know a lot deep inside but sometimes that reiteration is important to know that you know is and there's always something to learn so that's how i'm feeling right now i'm always positive i'm a blue sky thinker always <laughs> somewhere over the rainbow <laughs> so for me it always has to be better than what it was yesterday so yeah, thank you so much for sharing, you know, your thoughts. And it's great to feel that we are doing, we are in the heading in the right direction. Thank you so much, Poonam, Michael, and Donna. And I'll just end by passing back to Jilly. And I'd like to thank Jilly for being brave, being brave and pulling together and planning out this event and delivering this event. And um, you know, we've been quite fortunate at Scottish Business Network to be able to help a little bit with this. But um, I'll just pass back to Jilly. No, yeah, thank you, Russell, and uh, thank you to the Scottish Business Network as well for supporting us. Um, my goodness, uh, Poonam, Donna, Michael, yourself, Russell, I, from the bottom of my heart, thank you so much for giving your time and your insights today. I hope that everyone found it as uh, useful and as uplifting as I have. It's uh, invaluable, absolutely wonderful, and yeah, I thank you. Thank you a thousand times. <laughs>